I, I have been <coughs> speaking for the last few times in the book of Proverbs, but as we uh, enter into the Advent season, I wanted to change and to go to a more, a bit uh, theological uh, approach, a message this morning, uh, talking about uh, Jesus Christ and revisit some of the very important doctrine of our faith. And um, I want to go to the book of Colossians, the fullness of Christ, and uh, the city of Colossia, we can see that uh, over here, uh, Colossia is, is here in this middle rectangle, and then the rectangle is uh, magnified over there. So it gives you an idea of uh, near to La Laodicea, Ephesus is over there. So this is a small town that uh, the Apostle Paul never traveled to when he wrote this letter. He is not the one who founded the church. Epaphras was uh, the one that made known the hope of the gospel to them, and they have received it. And um, not long after the, the church was established, false teachers came to introduce uh, false teaching to take away or diminish uh, the divinity, the deity of Jesus Christ, his uh, supremacy, and his role as a redeemer and everything. So that is in the context in which uh, the Apostle Paul wrote to this church, this wonderful letter. Um, a scholar, William Barclay, says that it is one of the facts of the human mind that a man thinks only as much as he has to. Like usually we, we just think about the ordinary things. We, we don't go into deep thinking of a subject unless we have to. So that's what basically it means. The, the human mind, um, that a man thinks only as much as he has to. So it is not until a man finds his faith opposed and attacked that he really begins to think out its implication. When your faith gets attacked, then you start to think about it and what are you going to do and then you feel threatened. And it is not until the church is confronted with some dangerous heresies that uh, the church begins to realize the riches of our belief, what we believe. But we, we can rest safely, we can ignore these topics, and most of us do, un until it gets threatened. If you would be in some of these uh, countries that uh, are mentioned here, uh, you will know what it means to cherish the Word of God, to hold on to your faith, the cost of persevering. Uh, I heard so many testimonies this uh, Thursday night when I went to this meeting, uh, many moving testimonies in Malaysia, and Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh, and many countries over here. In Laos, for example, we saw the picture of a pastor who was put in prison for one and a half year because he celebrated Christmas. Just for the simple reason that they had this Christmas celebration. One and a half year in prison. And uh, the testimonies of people in different places where they have been beaten, the church has been uh, destroyed or, or soiled just to make them pure and things like that, and angry mobs and burnings and beatings and uh, you know, illegally uh, arrested and put in prison. And um, Anil was making a comment on this, and it is... Um, I, about all of these testimonies. He says, they are persecuted, they are forced to recant their faith, but they do not recant their faith. I was watching a video about these couples, completely uneducated people, very poor. They have been chased away from their village. They live under a little, like, like a tent, a, a made up shack. And uh, the, the wife, uh, we couldn't see her face, the wife was saying, they came here to uh, force us to recant our faith, but we cannot, we cannot recant. Why? She says, I was demon possessed, and Jesus Christ saved me. I cannot recant my faith. This is a power of God. <clears throat> I remember years ago, <clears throat> years ago in, in China, sorry, I have a cup of water here. Years ago in the uh, inner Mongolia, in some of the uh, poorest place on earth, in this place, uh, one of the Chinese pastors who uh, was uh, preaching in these areas, reaching out to people, he said 
that they were poorer than the poor of Africa, the people that he met there. So that's the comments that he made. <coughs> and uh, he says, these people, you cannot teach theology to them. They will not understand anything about theology. They can only understand what Christ will do for them. When they are healed from their disease, when Christ performs a miracle for them, then this they can understand. That's the theology that they can understand. And we have this theology. We have this, this privilege to have, and we, we have more than, than what they, they do in a way, because we not only have the miracles and the testimonies of our faith, but we have the theology of scriptures to tell us and to explain to us the mystery of grace, the, the deity of Jesus Christ. And we have a, a foundation, a truth to support our faith. He says, they are persecuted, they are forced to recant, but they do not recant. And the, the, the comment that stuck with me says, they persevere in believing in this man who lived 2,000 years ago in a land that they don't even know where it is. Many of them, they are, don't know geography. They don't know that where Bethlehem and Judea is and all this. But they still believe in this man, the name of Jesus, because of who he is to them. That, that's a miracle of faith. So that's important. So there is no other passage in the New Testament that will bring up so many concentrated doctrines about Jesus Christ than this text of uh, Colossians chapter 1. First, what he has done. He has delivered us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemptions, the forgiveness of sin. He delivered us. And the word for delivered us means to rush out and draw to yourself. Someone is sinking, you throw the, the uh, flotation, and then you, you, you pull them to, to safety. So that's what Jesus Christ came. And he, he, he rescued us from a very powerful kingdom of darkness that we were, uh, you know, slaves, uh, subjugated under this, this power, a, a power who possessed authority, who overpowered us. And then he translated us or transferred us into the safety under the care of his possession. And the word here described the deportation of a population. Jesus rescued us, but then he did not leave us to uh, run around in the wilderness. He brought us to a place of safety. He transferred us into his safety and to his love and to his kingdom. It is a kingdom. He took us from a kingdom that overpowered us and he brought us into another kingdom where we have a king. A king of power, of authority, who rule over this world and he takes care of you. You belong to him. Say amen to that this morning. Amen. He redeemed us. This means to release a prisoner by the payment of a ransom. And in this text, there's a lot of uh, comments in uh, Colossians chapter 1 that sometimes are difficult to interpret and that many false teachers have even used to, to twist and, and uh, distort the, the truth of the word of God. By the way, this uh, payment of a ransom was not paid to Satan. Some, maybe you have heard it in the preaching before. So we were under the, the, the dominion of Satan, so this ransom has been paid to Satan to free us. Satan is not God. He, 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 we, Jesus did not pay anything to Satan, so please remove that completely of our, our house. Jesus obeyed the Father. Jesus paid the ransom on Calvary for you, not to Satan, but to meet the demand of justice of the Father. So that's very important. Don't never elevate uh, the Satan to a role of, of authority to equal to God. That's very far from that. He was a created being, uh, and God is God. Uh, alone is God. One of the strongest statements about the divine nature of Christ is found in these uh, scriptures over here. Let's read this text together. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For all things in heaven and on earth were created by him. All things were visible or invisible, whether throne or dominions. All things were created through him and for him. 
He Himself is before all things, and all things are held together in Him. I want you to make a, a simple observation of the all things repeated and repeated and repeated. Not only there, but in the next series of scriptures in uh, verse 18, there's more all things. So, so that's, that's significant for us. But let's begin with the first uh, statement. He is the image of the invisible God. And the word image has carried two uh, ideas. Jesus Christ enabled us to see God an invisible God, a spirit being, too big to be contained and understood. So in order to, to have a, a, a glimpse or uh, to grasp how God is, it, it is, uh, in Hebrew we read that he is the exact likeness of God's own being. We understand God only when we see Jesus. Otherwise, the concept of God could be very, very poor. The Israelites built a cow. They made a golden cow. And they had been instructed not to do that. But in spite of anything, they could not make an, an understanding, so they made a cow. In many of the countries of the world, people uh, worship uh, a tree. Uh, they worship something from nature. They change the glory of the uh, God, of the true God, into the likeness of man, the likeness. I was reading this week in the book of uh, Isaiah, and you can find it in the Psalm and Ezekiel, about the stupidity of people who bow before uh, uh, idols. And then in Isaiah, they were explaining how stupid it is that the man cuts a tree, he used the wood, to warm himself, to cook his food, and then takes part of the same wood, give, put two eyes on it, and put some jewels around it, and then, oh, you are my God, you are my God. And uh, so that doesn't make sense. But without Jesus Christ, we maybe would be part of the group uh, that we would be doing that. We, we laugh, but it's not, it's not funny because the whole world is doing that. Because w what else? They have not received the understanding, the revelation, the conviction of who this wonderful Jesus Christ is. So Jesus is the image. He helps us to understand the likeness of God. He's also the representative. He is kind of the, uh, the ambassador, the messenger, the one sent by the Father to take care of God's interest in this world. He came in this world to achieve something, to do the, what God had planned for him to do, the, the salvation of our soul. So he is the image, but he is also the representative. Uh, the next part of the sentence is where we may have some uh, difficulty to understand the doctrine. The firstborn over all creation. And some false teacher jumped on this declaration, you see? Jesus Christ has been born. Uh, so he's been created, in other words. Uh, so, because it says the firstborn over here. So the word used here, it's very important we understand, is a prototokos. And think about a prototype uh, in the sense of uh, unique. It, it's, it's something never seen before. It's something uh, very, very distinct. So we will explain a little bit. And the word firstborn is used in three different uh, meanings in the Bible. Uh, for example, Jesus was the firstborn of Mary, the, the literal sense. But that's not the, the use. And we will see also later on in context that w what is, sometimes it is hard to define a, a term just looking at the term. But if you put it in this context, you understand the intention of the one who expressed that concept. The other uh, way is like the figurative sense. In Exodus chapter 4, uh, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. So that is a concept from the Bible. Israel, the people of God, is my firstborn. And why is that? It's not that he was uh, a natural birth. It's, it's a figurative sense. It described the distinctive place in which the nation of Israel had in God's plan. It's special. You are my firstborn, Israel. You're mine, and this is my plan for you. And then the, the most um, uh, interesting for us this morning is Psalm 99. God says that he will make David, King David, his firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. 
So what does he mean by making David uh, higher than the kings of the, the firstborn of the earth? God determined to give him a place of unique supremacy, primacy, and sovereignty. And that is where that terms come uh, to, to uh, the meaning of it come at, at this point. Uh, the Lord Jesus is God's son in a way that is unique. Nobody, no other being can fill that role. He existed before all creation and he occupies the highest position of supremacy over it. It's a title of priority. It's a title of priority of position. It's where he is position and importance to God. In verse 15, the emphasis is on the priority of Jesus' rank over and above creation. And then we will see even more of that and it will become clearer as we go on. Verse 16, for, it starts, it's, it links verse 15 to verse, what he's going to say in verse 16. For all things in heaven and on earth were created by him. So what are we doing here? What Paul is doing here? Paul is, goes on building up his statement he is going to make you understand how great, how supreme Jesus Christ is. So, so he's building up his ideas to, to enlighten us this morning, and he will go on and on and on. So he's building up this truth with all the titles that follows and these descriptions here. The four here shows us without any doubt that Jesus Christ is not a created being. So that clears that up. When it says he is the firstborn, he is not a created being because here it says that he created all things. And we will see a bit later that to create, it is a divine attribute. Only God can create. Human being cannot make something of nothing. So it, 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 he, is, he is God by that statement. It is clear. For all things were created, not only by him, but also you will see in this text, through him and for him. And you will see three prepositions in this text that is also important. By him, he is the creator. Okay? He has a unique and absolute power to create. And only God has that. It is created through him. Here, Jesus is described a bit uh, as, an, as an architect and an engineer. He is, he's got the plan. He knows what he's doing, why he's doing, what will be the purpose of creating all things and all the usefulness of all creating, even the, the bugs that you don't like, the mosquitoes, the, even the, 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 the cockroach, the cows, the, the, uh, the, the, the goats, uh, whatever it is that uh, has happened, the beauty of nature, the mountains, the rivers, and the, the cycles, the laws of nature. Jesus Christ is described that the, all these things in heaven, on earth, he is the architect, he is the engineer, he knows the purpose of everything and what he's doing. And it is created for him. So it is for his pleasure, he is the ultimate ruler, he is in control over that, he is, it is the goal, he is the goal of the creation. And Paul goes on a bit further again. Uh, and saying, let me see, let's move on. Am I there already? No, I'm going too fast. Verse uh, uh, 16. All things visible and invisible. What does that mean? And why is it important to us to know that? Including thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. Why is it important to you to read these things? You know, if you are like me, many times you just go to this text, you get familiar, you read through, and it doesn't really make a big uh, wow effect on, on your life. But actually, we should pause here and make a wow effect over here. Because all things visible, the created things, the material things that we see, but the invisible also. He created these invisible. And then he gives even a descriptions of what he means by the invisible things. <coughs> Spiritual beings, angels, spirits, good spirits, bad spirits, a spiritual world. And you know, we are so 
taken up uh, in this material world that this spiritual reality is often not really something that we think about. You know, many times we look at our problems like material problems. We look at uh, unloving people like they are. We look at the situations that we face just like in our material world. But there are some things behind this material world that are against, against us. It confirms, that's why we should pause here and take a moment because this text confirms the existence of invisible beings. And what do they do, these, uh, these, these beings? They have dominions and thrones, principalities, powers, rulers, authorities. So what does that mean to us? It means that they can exercise uh, certain controls, oppositions. They can do something, they can attack, they, can, they, can, they exist for, with power, they, they exist. And you and I, being men and women and children of flesh, mortal people, are not equipped to fight them off. And that's why there's so much violence and ugliness and discouragement and suicide and, uh, you know, immorality in this world. Look back to the invisible world and you will see the cause of that. And you have similar texts like that in Second Corinthians chapter 10 that all weapons are not natural weapons to, to fight the strongholds. You have again in Ephesians chapter 6, this uh, be strong in the Lord and all of these spiritual beings that we have to fight against with the armor of God. And we have many other texts uh, telling us Daniel was fasting for 21 days when the angel came and delivered to him a message from you know all of these beings and what was going in the spiritual warfare in the world. Uh, uh, Elisha and his servant, when they were surrounded by an army enemy, and when, when the eyes of the servant, he saw a spiritual being sent by God to, to, to be with them. So we don't see this world. We, we often ignore and are unaware of this world, but this is real something that we should affect our life. So are you equipped in faith? Are you filled with the Spirit? So when these dark spirits will come opposing the children of God, like you, with temptations, persecutions, doubts, oppressions, demon possessions, adversities, and all sorts of uh, uh, disasters that will come into your life, where do they think come from? Are they coming from just the material world, or do they come from other sources? And how, how well are we equipped in faith to prepare to fight against these things? I remember when I was, uh, just before I was converted and after I was converted, I was instructed about the king, this kingdom. You know, I thought for a time before I was a Christian that uh, there was a spiritual world, but I didn't know the difference. Like anything that would be supposedly spiritual, like even magic or astrology, uh, horoscope or whatever it is, it was all spiritual, so it was all kind of okay. It's something that exists. It's only when I was struck by the Word of God that I understood there is that world and there's this dark forces, evil spirit. So this is something we need to pause because it says that for all things were created by Him, by him. all things visible and visible throne, dominion, all things were created through him and for him. So he's, he's above all of that. His position is above all of that. He created these things. He rules over. His rule is greater than their rules. Say amen to that. Amen. So we need to, to feel that, that safety this morning. Verse 17. He himself is before all things, and all things are held together in him. And that the verb is, is not a mistake in verse 17. Is, is the actual good verb tense. It's not he was. It is really he is. He continued to be. It's the correct grammar uh, verb you, you use here. He is the eternal pre-existent God. He is before all things. He's always been. And he holds all things together. And again, there's a wonderful place to pause here and to uh, be in awe and say, thank you, Lord. Uh, in him, all things 
continue, endure, exist in our hell together. He is the source, he is the sustainer of what? What does he sustain? I'm, I'm asking you that question because it's important. It seems simple, but it's very important. I want to make a point on that. He is the sustainer. All things are held together. What is it that he sustains? All things. Do you have a problem? Yes. Where should we go? All things he sustain. He sustain you. He sustain your life. He is right there with you. Um, F. B. Mayer, which is a theologian, wrote this about this text. Here is a paragraph which should be part of our daily intercessions for ourselves and for others. Just, just take for a moment what, what he means by that. When every day you go to God and you pray and you make your known needs, you are crushed, you are under burdens, things do not work, you are on the losing side, you cannot go on anymore, your problems are too big for you. Remember, and that's what F.B. Mayer says, bring it in prayer, think about this, who is the sustainer of all things? What does he sustain? What can he sustain? He can sustain everything. Is your situation too big for him? No, it is not. So let's remember that when you pray, Lord, you say in your word that you are the sustainer of all things. So Lord, I want to realize what it means and I come to you with that in mind. My situation, the situation of my loved ones is just in front of you. You sustain all things. Everything goes on. There is order. There is power. Lord, I come to you. I depend on you. And that's why we should, uh, because God, Jesus, is the sustainer of our life. None of us should live independently of him. We should not try to just go on in our own abilities. We have one that loves you. You already belong to him. He already redeemed you. He already put you in this safety. So he's not going to just let you go, abandon you. He is there with you on your side. Remember that. How many of you will be praying differently tomorrow morning? You will be praying that the Lord, I understood something and this is going to be part of my prayer to strengthen my faith, really. Then let's go to the next verse, verse 18. He is the head of the body of the church. Oh, we're coming closer and closer. We are coming closer to us. He is the head of the church as well as the beginning. The head speaks of a place, the chief, the guide, the dictates, the controls. He occupies this place as well as the beginning. Again, there's confusion here. With the word beginning, why do we use beginning? The word used here is the word archi, and it is used also in Hebrews chapter 12, looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, the pioneer or the perfecter of our faith. So that's in that sense that we look. He is at the beginning, not, not in the sense of time, but in the sense of source. He is at the beginning of the, ch the church. The church is his creation. You are the idea of God. Lighthouse, hey, think about that. Lighthouse was established by the idea of God. And for those of you who have been in Lighthouse long enough and have heard the testimonies of those who were here at first and founded the church, you will attest to that, that Lighthouse has been established by the hand of God. This is, Lighthouse is a miracle. Amen, I would like to hear amen for that because amen. listen, look at uh, where we are today and what God has done with this little uh, group of us here. So the head speaks and dictates and controls and he was at the beginning and the sense of source and the moving power of God. The church is the new creature of Jesus Christ. And Christ is the, the source of the church life. He is also the firstborn. Again, it comes again. The firstborn from among the dead. Again. And what do we want to say about that again? So that he himself may become first in all things. 
Because his resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus, proves something in uh, Paul's arguments to us this morning. The resurrection of Jesus proves his lordship over this mortal, material world. Nothing can stop Jesus. Uh, Herod cannot, Pilate cannot keep him. The, the Jewish leaders could not keep him. The Roman soldiers could not keep him. The, the stone rolled uh, from the tomb could not stop stop him. He rose from the dead. He proves that he is Lord. He proves that his mission has been accomplished. He proves his superiority and so that he himself may become first in all things. We, we read that over here, okay, that he may become, or that in all things he may have the preeminence. That's what other Bible says over that text here. All who trust in Christ will rise again to eternal life with him. And verse 18 is kind of a, a summary of what he has been sitting. So that in all things he may have the preeminence. You know, I'm not an English speaker from my mother. I'm a French speaker. So sometimes I need to go to a dictionary to learn something. Don't know if you are like me. But so the word like eminence, preeminence, I have an idea what it is, but I, sometimes I need to understand it a little bit more uh, in depth. So, okay, so what does eminent mean? And what preeminent, what, what, what's the pre has to do? What, 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 what truth does it mean? So I went to the dictionary last night and I looked at it. So let me um, tell you what I discovered about that. Eminent means that someone has become distinguished and stands out from the crowd. He's eminent among many uh, students. He's eminent. He's, he's distinct. He's, he's above that. But preeminent, wow, preeminent is the most eminent of the eminent. <laughs> he is the leading authority. He's got the top of the list. And he is uh, peerless. Uh, this thing from his peers is above all of this, is without comparison, is preeminent of this. So that's our Jesus. That's your God. Amen? Amen. That's your Jesus. That's what we are celebrating in the, this Christmas season. So Paul concludes his thought here and he declared that Jesus Christ is fully God. But then he goes a little bit further uh, with this next thought that is really extraordinary. For, again, there's a for, he goes on building all of his arguments. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in the Son, and through him to reconcile all things to himself by making peace through the blood of his cross, through him, whether things on earth or things in heaven. God was pleased to have what? All of his fullness. So the word fullness here is ver becomes very, very important for us because of all the previous statements. Image of God, firstborn of creation, creator, eternally preexistent, the head of the church, the victor over death, first and preeminent in all things. We come to fullness. And fullness and theology, it talks about totality of divine power and attributes. He is God, and that's what this first chapter Paul was writing to this church that had been influenced and attacked by false teachers that diminished the deity of Jesus Christ. He says, the fullness, it had pleased God, the Father, to have the fullness, the totality of divine powers and attributes to inhabit Him. And the word dwell in Him means Permanently, it's not only like a, just a visitation of power, but it is in Him for forever. Where will you find that fullness? In the church? And the Pope? And the saints? And the Virgin Mary? And the sacraments? You cannot find it anywhere but in Christ Himself. For it pleased the God the Father to have that in Himself. So let me ask you a question this morning. If you want more of God, how can you get more of God? It's clear over here what we are getting from the, the teaching of Paul. If you are thirsty for more of God, you can find it in Christ. He's got that fullness, so just go to Him. 
Uh, there's a little thought here about the expression, for God was pleased. God was pleased in the book of Isaiah to crush Jesus so that he could die on the cross. It pleased the Lord to bruise him, put him to grief. Once restitution is made, he will see descendants and enjoy long life, and the good pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So it pleased the Lord to crush and lead his son to this suffering because of his love for us. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in his son. And you will notice that verse 20 is linked with verse 19. You could start verse uh, 20 by reading, For God was pleased to reconcile all things to himself through him, through Christ, by making peace through the blood of the, of the, of the cross. Only God can do that. Think, think for a moment, just a simple argument. Would God the Father be pleased to give all the fullness of his divine power and attributes to an angel, to a human being, to second rank? No. He could only pass the, the, these, these powers to God. Only God can have this power. So that's a proof that God. And the big theme of this chapter is reconciliation. All of these things were necessary for you to be reconciled with God. The conditions of reconciliation, the privilege of reconciliation were already accomplished in Christ. Amen? Hallelujah. We close quickly. And you were at one time strangers. We see the re wonderful results of this reconciliation. The fact that Jesus Christ is God, the fact that he is supreme, the fact that he is preeminent over that, it pleased God to have the fullness in him. It pleased God to use Jesus Christ to reconcile the sinners, the enemies of God, to change our status. Let me give you a little uh, a story. It's a bit funny, but it has a, a deep truth in it. The pastor who is telling the story says, A man once came to see, to see me because he, he had difficulties at home. Listen carefully to the words. He was not a very well-educated man, and sometimes he would get his words confused. So he said, my wife and I are having martial problems. And he meant to see marital problems. <laughs> but he says martial problems. So, so the, the later the pastor found out that they really were having martial problems. They were really, <laughs> they were really at, 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 uh, at war with each other. But the word that caught my attention were, Pastor, me and my wife need a reconciliation. And he meant reconciliation. But he used the word reconciliation. And the pastor thought about it. He says, that is not a bad choice, actually, of word. You need a, reconcil a reconciliation. So, so as, as sinners, we needed a reconciliation in order to be at peace with God. Our sins were canceled on the cross. He accomplished that. And only God can do that. No other human being could do that. The go-between had to be perfect, and he had to be, to be God. So anyway, in closing, when we look at the wonderful result of this reconciliation, uh, there's a theologian, Mr. Erdman, that says, in Christ, is found a God who is near, a God who cares, who hears, who pities, and who saves. And this is very, very important. So in closing, first, Jesus Christ, we have seen that, that can take care of all things. Do you believe that? Yes. So are you crushed this morning, worrying? Are you at the end of your uh, resources at the end of your abilities do you have a need are you in a crisis do you have difficulties Jesus Christ has taken care of all things Amen. you belong to him so will you trust him second Jesus Christ in him we have God's fullness we are filled full complete in him so there's no need to add anymore no religion, 
no goodness, just trust Jesus Christ for the forgiveness, for the peace with God, for unity with God. And number three, God is pleased when His Son, Jesus Christ, is honored and we give preeminence to His Son. That's how you can please God. That's how you can and express your thankfulness. That's the only acceptable act of worship, actually, to God, is to praise His Son for what He has been uh, doing. Amen? Amen? So ask yourself, is Christ Jesus preeminent in your life? Because in your life and in my life, Jesus Christ deserves to have the preeminence in our daily life, in our actions, in our decisions, in our relationship. We need to do that. Could we stand this morning? Hallelujah.